Hello students, welcome to EPG Patashala. I am Dr. Shiva Senani from University of Hyderabad, Department of Sanskrit Science. Today in the paper, uh, Vedic, Epic and Puranic Culture of India, we study the module Arthashastra. In this module, our learning objectives are to be introduced to the book Arthashastra, its author, subject matter, time, etc. And within the book, we'll consider a few topics, uh, mainly public administration, the mandala theory, the six measures of foreign policy, also called Shadgunyam, the constituent elements of the states or the Sapta Prakritis, and uh, at the end, we'll consider the relevance of Arthashastra in modern times. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the way this presentation is, uh, this module is arranged in three parts. First is introduction, second one is the contents of Arthashastra, so that we get a familiarity with uh, this particular book, and then we'll examine its relevance in the modern context. Let us start with the introduction. Uh, the name is Arthashastra. It will also, it's also called the Kautali Arthashastra or the Chanakya Sutram. We need to be careful here to differentiate it from the Chanakya Niti. Chanakya Niti is an anthology or a collection of aphorisms, whereas Chanakya Sutram refers to uh, the book uh, Arthashastra. It is also called as uh, Danda Niti, and this is one of the 18 vidyas enumerated in the traditional lists. Uh, if you are wondering what the 18 vidyas are, uh, the slokas go like this. Anga nivedas chatvaro mimamsa nyaya vistaraha puranam dharma shastrancha vidya hyete chaturthasha ayur vedo dhanur vedo gandharvas chet chanukramat artha shastram parantasmat vidya hashta dasasmrutaha. So these are the 18 vidyasthanas, that is the four vedas, the six vedangas. And then uh, Nyaya, Mimamsa, uh, Purana and uh, Dharma Shastram, these make the 14. On top of the 14, another 4 are added, Ayurveda, Dhanurveda, uh, Gandharva Veda, that is music, and also uh, Artha Shastram. This is the 18th Vidyasthana, traditional subject of learning. It has been traditionally reserved for the ruling class. The book itself was known through references but was lost to us for a long time. It was discovered in 1905 by R. Shama Shastri in Mysore and uh, published by him in uh, 1909. He provided an English translation in uh, 1915. And then in 1924, T. Ganapati Shastri of Kerala also published this with his own Sanskrit commentary. These were the first publications of the book. Later, about 40-45 uh, years later, Professor R. P. Kangle, he uh, did about 30 years of research into Arthashastra and produced the definitive version of the text in three volumes. Regarding the name of the author, in traditional circles, a name Kautilya is also popular. Uh, but uh, following Ganapati Shastigaru, we uh, uh, use the word uh, Kautilya here rather than uh, Kautilya. Regarding uh, Chanakya, it is said that he has helped his uh, king Chandragupta Maurya. He has also uh, ended the reign of Nandas and also given as the Arthashastra. This is uh, given in the Arthashastra book itself in this shloka. Yena shastram cha shastram cha nanda rajagata cha bhuhu amarshena udhruta udhrutan yashu tena shastram idam krutam by whom shastra, shastra and also the nanda rajagata bhuhu the land occupied by nanda all these were rescued by him instantaneously. By Saja Chanakya this shastra is being uh, written. So we know that from this that he is the minister of Chandragupta Maurya, that he helped him overthrow Nandas and ascend the throne. So, uh, this the life history of Chanakya has been the subject matter of the drama called Mudra Rakshasam in Sanskrit. He is also held to be the author of Chanakya Niti, but then uh, it's a collection. So uh, we don't deal with Chanakya Niti in this module. We focus on Arthashastra only. Fourth century BC is the time uh, based uh, on uh, the assigned date of Chandragupta Maurya. We have references of this book in other Sanskrit works like Dashakumara Charitam of Dandi. Uh, in the Tamil uh, book Tirukkural, the second uh, Kural also draws from this particular uh, text. So these are the uh, connections of later literature with this particular uh, thing. We can take the date to be around 4th century BC. This book is divided into 15 Adhikaranas. Each Adhikarana has many Adhyayas. In total there are 150 Adhyayas. Uh, each Adhyaya has many Sutras. 
In total, there are 5,370 sutras, but it is simply said as uh, a 6,000 uh, sutra book. Normally, that is how it is referred to as. Uh, the purpose of Chanakya was uh, twofold. Uh, artha means uh, wealth, or in the case of kings, wealth is kingdom. So, the science of how to win a kingdom and how to rule it properly so that it, it prospers. So, this is a subject matter. How do I win a kingdom and how do I rule it? Again, in winning a kingdom, there is theory and practice. So, there is a theory of international relations and also military strategy is also covered by him in the later part. So, uh, this is the structure of the book. The first five adhikaranas deal with uh, how to rule the kingdom so that it prospers. The second part, nine adhikaranas deal with how to uh, conduct foreign affairs, and uh, how to conduct military campaigns so that one wins uh, newer and newer parts, adds uh, newer and newer parts of the kingdom. The last Adhikarana deals with author, what are known as Tantra Yuktis. We will deal with them at the end. Uh, so, now that we have introduced the broad structure of the book, its author, its time, let us look at the um, oh, salient features, the contents of the book. I will give you an overview first and then take you through some of the topics such as training of the prince, administration of the state, the Mandala theory, six measures of foreign policy, seven prakritis, tantra yuktis, and also other topics. You have a summary of all the uh, topics covered uh, given as in a tabular form. The 15 adhikaranas deal with uh, first is the training of prince, second is the activity of heads of departments, third is the one concerning judges, fourth uh, it deals with suppression of criminals, and fifth is the one dealing with secret conduct that is of spies, etc. These five together form the first part, which is uh, the uh, administration or public administration. The second part starts with the Mandala theory, wherein the circle of kings as the basis is given in the sixth Adhikarana. Then the Shadgunyam or six measures of pol foreign policy are covered. Uh, then details are entered into with the concern concerning the topic of calamities in the uh, uh, eighth Adhikarana. Then uh, military issues are taken up in the ninth Adhikarana dealing with the activity of king about to march. Uh, then the other Adhikaranas deal mainly with war, that is uh, concerning war, policy towards principalities, concerning the weaker king, means of taking a fort, uh, concerning secret practices. The last 14th Adhikarana is about uh, doing rites and passages, which are like black magic, which are designed to bring downfall of the enemy and which are also designed to protect the king against that. The 15th Adhikarana deals with uh, Tantra Yuktis. So, these are the broad chapters or Adhikaranas within the book. Let us start with the first salient topic called the training of the prince. Here, uh, the text deals with training of the prince in 21 Adhyayas. It starts with a list of the contents of the work. This is one particular Tantra Yukti, that is a device of uh, doing science or how do you deal with a particular thing. First is just list all the topics, that is what is done. Uh, this essentially means it is a syllabus for the king's training. Some of the important observations that we can note here are the position of Arthashastra is that Veda lays down the Dharma. So, it is very clear that uh, Arthashastra is a Vedic book which has Veda as its uh, main support. So, all Dharma flows from Veda, this is what is reiterated by the Arthashastra. The main dharmas which are common to all are listed, which are non-violence, ahimsa, uh, satyam that is truth, shaucham, purity, anasuya, non-spiteful, anrusamsya, kindness and kshama, forbearance. These are the dharmas which are common to all. This is what the Arthashastra uh, teaches. Uh, another thing that we could note is that the king shall not allow people to deviate from their duty. That is, it is the duty of the king to uphold. Dharma. Here we also are introduced to the Matsya Nyaya which is very popular. This is the maxim of the fish, wherein the bigger fish eats the smaller fish. The might is the right is what we call in English for this. So, what happens when a king does not rule properly or there is no king? Anarchy prevails where might is the right and the weaker people are harassed by the stronger people. One of the interesting topics, interesting uh, uh, topics given in the training of princes is restraint of sense organs. Normally, it is said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, first thing a, a prince is trained in is, in is in restraint of sense organs. We could do well to do include this in the syllabus of our modern rulers. 
uh, this was there in a text which is 2500 years old. The pedagogy of Arthashastra is through stories. There are various stories told because a dry, boring, I mean, uh, theoretical manual would be very boring. So the princes are told about stories of Janmejaya, Ravana, Duryodhana, Kartavirya, Arjuna, etc. Through these stories, uh, the principles of uh, Dandashastra, Dandaniti or Arthashastra are taught to them. The ideal is the Rajarshi, one who has control of his senses. And this has been the ideal not merely in Arthashastra but in related literature. We see for example in Kalidasa that uh, Dushyanta is a Rajarshi. Uh, this is the ideal that kings strove to achieve and that's what Arthashastra aims in its training of the uh, prince. There are other issues like uh, desirable qualities in offices, officers of the civil service. Uh, there is meritocracy is prescribed uh, rather than based on relationships, etc. Then uh, one interesting topic is that corruptibility is actively tested. Uh, is this person corruptible? That's a kind of test they prescribed in those days. The other topics dealt with here are secret service, uh, watching over uh, and winning over enemies parties, uh, the rules of council that is mantranam, rules for envoys and ambassadors, protection of princes and protection from princes. Uh, this is an interesting one. Princes are seen as a danger to the king. History bears this out where so many kings have killed their own uh, fathers. Within Chandragupta Maurya's dynasty, we see that by the time of Ashoka, this uh, fratricide has happened. So Arthashastra anticipates this, maybe it was prevailing, prevalent at that time. It also deals with protection of the king from the prince. We also have duties and ideal timetable for a king. Uh, those who are interested can consult the work and learn more about this. We'll end this topic with one shloka from Arthashastra. Praja sukhe sukham ragnyaha prajanam chahite hitam natma priyam hitam ragnyaha Prajanam to Priyam Hitam. Happiness of the king lies in the happiness of people and his welfare in theirs. That which is dear to the king is not what is beneficial to him. Rather, that which is dear to the people is beneficial to the king. Uh, what more do we want than our rulers to have this, to take this to heart and then be ready to rule? So this we've seen is the training of uh, princes. We'll uh, go to the next one within public administration, that is the administration itself. This is the largest adhikarana and has material not found elsewhere in contemporary text and even in much later texts. Very detailed uh, um, uh, information is available in this particular adhikarana. We will quickly go through them. Uh, first formation of villages with 100 to 500 families is discussed. You will be interested to know that 500 families still would be about the average size of a village 2500 years later. Then the division of land for various purposes is dealt with, that is zonal planning. Uh, there are also chapters on construction and layout of forts, the duties of superintendent of treasury and revenue, uh, and so on. Six sources of revenue are recognized from the fort, that is the city, from the countryside, irrigation works, forests, cattle and uh, trade routes. Then uh, we have various adhyayas dealing with duties of accounts officers. Uh, chapters dealing with embezzlement of funds and uh, rules on disgorgement of funds. Uh, nowadays we are no longer doing it, but earlier if somebody was found embezzling funds, the investigation ended with disgorging the funds as well, that is taking the funds back. Uh, corruption of government officers has been recognized as inevitable, so the king is advised to be always in control. There are also chapters on royal edicts which shows that Arthashastra is familiar with Nirukta and uh, Vyakaranam, the two Vedangas, uh, which is not a surprise, but it gives the relative dating of uh, Arthashastra. Then the four Upayas are uh, dealt with here. These are very popularly known, uh, Samadana, Bheda, Dandopayas. An Upaya is a device used to achieve the purpose and then removed. It is like a scaffolding that we build before building the building. Once the building is ready, we remove the scaffolding. Similarly, an Upaya is like that. So to get something done, these are the four devices that are taught by uh, Kautalya, that is Sama, uh, Dana, he calls it as Upapradana, later on he calls it as Dana as well, Bheda and uh, Danda. Sama is reconciliation, Dana is uh, trying to give something, Bheda is uh, creation of doubt and use of threats uh, and then finally Danda is the punishment, that, that is the last resort. Within the administration of states uh, of the state, 
the if you just look at the list of the departments, we'll understand that not much has changed. Uh, the departments dealt with are mines, goldsmithy, trade in gold, granary, commerce, forest produce, armory, weights and measures, measures of space and time, tolls and toll dues, weavers, liquor, slaughterhouse, courtesans, shipping, horses, cattle and elephants, chariots, infantry and commander, passports, city and rural administration. It's amazing that after two millennia, these remain more or less the main uh, uh, aspects of administration. What has happened is of late the services part of the economy has grown a lot, but uh, we are lucky that we have a detailed manual of all these departments available to us dating from 4th uh, century BC. Another noteworthy point is it's not a mere list. When uh, Chanakya is dealing with uh, any particular subject, he gives exhaustive details. Let us just consider one example. He is dealing with, for example, the chapter on treasury. In treasury, various things come, money comes, granary, jewels. So within jewels, he gives the names and qualities of various gems, the descriptions and names of various necklaces, and the names and qualities of fine textiles. That is, the treasury in charge must know all goods of value. He must be able to value them properly. And that kind of detail we find about each and every department in this book. Uh, it is not a wonder then that the German translator uh, Johann Jakob Meyer said that Arthashastra is not a book but a library. That is, in each Adhyaya it is worth a book and this is a collection of so many books. Uh, we can go into more details but uh, the present uh, context does not permit that. This gives us a glimpse of the kind of detail and uh, the theory of public administration that we find in Arthashastra. Now we go to the other part of the book on how to win a kingdom. The important contribution of uh, Arthashastra not only to Indian literature, Indian thought, but world literature is its mandala theory. Let us examine that in some detail. This is taken up in the sixth Adhikarana. Uh, this theory imagines a mandala or circle of kings based primarily on geographic positions, identifies them as allies and enemies, and then devises a foreign relations strategy based on that. Uh, there is some uh, division of opinion amongst authors whether uh, Kautalya describes all neighbors as enemies. R. P. Kangli, the gen professor who studied Arthashastra in the greatest depth opines that is not the case. But then consider this, Kautalya knew that the king's son could be the king's enemy. If the son himself is not trusted, will the neighbor be trusted? The neighbor has all incentive to uh, harm the king. So it is not a surprise that generally he describes neighbors as enemies, but then this is uh, what we call uh, paranoia, which is very popular, common amongst leaders. Leaders are supposed to be always uh, on the guard. Let us look at uh, the Mandala theory. Uh, I've given a, a brief uh, depiction of the Mandala of Kings. This Mandala is partial and expands only in one direction. If you look at the hexagon in the roughly middle or slightly to the left of the center of the screen, the gray hexagon represents the Vijigishu or uh, the would-be conqueror, that is the present king. Everybody around him are in neighbors. The six uh, hexagons immediately in contact with the gray one. Three of them I have shown in red, three of them I have shown in um, orange or yellow that it might appear on your screens. These are the neutral ones and the red ones are the enemies. They are called Ari. Ari is a Sanskrit word for enemy. So uh, a king, whoever is his neighbor, there could be two neighbors, six neighbors, we don't know. All of them are either enemies or have potential to be enemies. Now look at the second layer, which is the people beyond the first arc of uh, red. They are in blue. That is, they are the neighbors of neighbors. Now these are described as uh, Mitram, allies, friend by uh, Chanakya. That is your enemy's enemy is your friend. Again, you note that not all of them uh, need to be like that. Some of them could be neutral. Similarly, we go to the third layer. That is the neighbor of the neighbor of neighbor. He is called Arimitram. That is a uh, friend of the enemy. Initially, the first uh, level neighbor is the enemy. Second level neighbor is the friend because he is your enemy's enemy. The third level is the friend of the enemy based on similar logic and so on it goes on. 
so this is the rajamandala based on this rajamandala uh, chanak uh, kautilya identifies 12 types of kings uh, we will see the 12 names first and then we will see how these 12 names contribute to strategy the 12 kings are vijigishu the one desirous of conquering uh, ari the enemy the madhyama that is he is close to vijigishu and also the enemy this madhyama is capable of helping them and also capable of suppressing them when they are not united apart from the madhyama there is another udasina there is a difference between the udasina and the madhyama udasina is the outside the spheres of influence of all the above three but capable of helping them and also capable of suppressing them these are some kind of uh, neutral uh, parties you think of india and pakistan and maybe iran or china and then there is a mitra uh, an ally and an arimitra the friend of enemy these are the six types of basic kings another six are mitra mitra friend of friend arimitra mitra friend of friend of enemy and then we get into some technical names parshnigraha enemy at the rear akranda friend at the rear and parshnigraha sara friend of the enemy at the rear so akranda sara is friend of the friend at the rear the rest of the eight are uh, uh, in the forward so we have 12 types of kings now each king has seven prakritis including himself one of the prakritis is allies so they are covered here if you remove them there are six relevant prakritis 12 kings with six relevant prakritis or constituent elements of the kingdom which are minister country fort the treasury and army these 72 elements become the building blocks of analyzing your foreign policy policy decisions have to be based on the relative strengths of these 72 elements to give an example you think of again india pakistan i said the king of pakistan is a prime minister but the army is stronger there uh, in the current position so one has to look at every element of the kingdom and not merely the king the minister the kind of country it is rich poor etc the defenses that is fort the treasury and also their army once we analyze all the 72 elements foreign policy evolves by itself this then represents the indian contribution to the theory of international relations uh, hindsight is cruel but just looking back was it the lack of skepticism about china's friendship uh, that cost us the war in 1962 i'm just thinking think about it now that we have seen the mandalas let us look at what happens after all the analysis finally we need to do something right that's the point of action there are six actions identified these are called the six measures of foreign policy what can a king do after his analysis uh, he can have peace sandhi he can go to war vigraha he can remain neutral that is called asana sitting he can march that is he is not at at war but he is threatening that is mobilization of troops that is called yana he can surrender to somebody samshraya surrender to a more powerful king or he need not decide he can decide uh, he can have war with one and peace with another this is called uh, dvaidhi bhava now if you look at the non aligned movement uh, it is basically asana we wanted not to be aligned with either usa or ussr in those uh, days so these six then are the measures of foreign policy they are also called shad gunya Uh, and this is very popular in um, sanskrit literature and later terms also this then is india's contribution to international relations the way these are discussed is we start with very simple uh, propositions for example if one is weak, weaker than the enemy then what should one do one should make peace one should not go and fight if one is very strong and prospering then one should make war and annex the next kingdom like this we start with simple propositions which are common sensical and then uh, kautilya deals with more and more complex situations in all this the king's decision making is based on two rules which is the king should take a decision which would further his interest the most <coughs> second the king should avoid the course of action which would ruin his projects or strength nothing else should decide our foreign policy right the decision should be based only on these two particular uh, criteria 
this is the uh, theory of Chanakya. There are 18 Adhyayas here uh, in the six measures of uh, foreign policy. Uh, second Adhyaya deals with conduct of king seeking to surrender. Third one prescribes policies for the weaker king. Fourth discusses neutrality after war and peace. And the next three discuss different consideration scenarios on marching and dual policy. And the eighth Adhyaya treats the conduct of a king about to be attacked. The different scenarios are covered. 9 to 12 are devoted to various treaties, how to get into treaties, how to deal with alliances, etc. So this is hardcore international relationships. At the last six Adhyayas describe strategy to tackle with the enemy at the rear, recoupment of diminished powers, uh, defense of a fort, the conduct of an attacking king, peace negotiations, and uh, conduct towards a Madhyama king or an Udasina king and the circle of kings. How should a king be to all these particular uh, uh, neighbors? As I said before, the various scenarios are discussed strictly in the framework of what is beneficial to the kingdom and uh, they do not exhaust all the possibilities. They can, they can get very complicated. So this has been a favorite uh, hunting ground or uh, uh, subject of exploration for Sanskrit poets. So we see that in the first and second sargas of Kirat Arjuniyam, there is a Mahakavyam by Baharavi, where uh, the particular uh, um, situation between Yudhishthira and Duryodhana is explored by the poet. Yudhishthira has gone on um, to gone to forest for uh, his forest, uh, what do you call, stay. Then what should Duryodhana do? Should he sit, sit, sit tight? Duryodhana actually goes about making friends. And uh, Bhima and Draupadi go to Yudhishthira into making war right now because if Duryodhana builds up his strength, then it might become difficult. So we see Shadgunyam at play here. Similarly, in the second sarga of Shishupala Vadham, the poet Maha similarly explores the various uh, considerations in the decision making of kings. And of course, now we see that uh, uh, within South Asia, all our neighbors seem to be against India. India has helped Bangladesh get freedom, but Bangladesh feels India is not on their side. So this is the real politic. This is what is dealt with uh, uh, by in um, Arthashastra. Given all these complexities, uh, Kautalya says that anybody who knows Arthashastra, he can simply play with his king. He toys with kings as if they are bound by his intellect. So for him, mastery of this Shadgunya makes the minister very, very powerful. And it is not really a wonder. Nowadays, we want our kings only to be masters of this particular um, craft. Uh, we briefly touched about the seven prakrutis or the seven constituent elements of uh, the kingdom. They are Swami, the king, Amatya, the minister, Janapada, the country, Durga, fort, Kosha, treasury, Danda, army, and Mitrani, allies or friends. And uh, the import, relative importance of each of these is in the order stated. That is, king is the most important, second most important is minister and so on. The book uh, describes each of these seven elements in some great detail at various places. Some people did not uh, understand why they are scattered, but then they are covered in the book. Each of these prakritis along with the king get to play in the Rajamandala because we said no, that there are 12 kings and we should look at six prakritis. Allies are not counted because they are included in the Rajamandala. The evaluation of these prakritis leads to one of the six measures of foreign policy. In a given situation, after evaluating all 72 elements, finally, the king makes a decision. Okay, now we need to go to war with X or Y. We need to make peace with Z, etc. Having dealt with these prakritis, a separate adhyaya is also uh, devoted to calamities to these particular uh, prakritis. This is the main text. We will also briefly observe uh, one more thing called the Tantra Yuktis. These are the stylistic devices of uh, explaining something to elucidate a scientific subject. Ayurveda and Arthashastra give 32 Tantra Yuktis. In Arthashastra, all the Tantra Yuktis have examples given from the text itself. We will deal with two examples here, Purva Paksha and Uttara Paksha. I have chosen these two because they are very popular across ancient Indian literature, not merely in uh, statecraft but in philosophy as well. Uh, we will consider uh, the Sutra 15.1.53. That statement which is fit to be rejected is the Purva Paksha. That is, it is the opponent's view. We state the opponent's view, convince the reader that opponent is right and then we reject it. 
the upon statement of opponents view is called purva paksha what is a purva paksha sutra 8.1.7 proposes that calamities of a minister are greater than those of a king you know some people might think chandragupta maurya was not a strong king chanakya was a great king so if chanakya had fever or some deadly disease then that's a bigger calamity it is plausible this is the view of bharadwaja the reasons given by bharadwaja are most projects or activities in a kingdom are undertaken by ministers and if these are suspended kingdom is weakened enemy would attack and the life of king is at threat it seems plausible this is the view of the opponent opponent as a not an enemy but somebody who takes a different stance now kautilya refutes this view in 8.1.12 and gives the reasons it is the king who appoints ministers takes counter measures etc he can always appoint a minister who is not indisposed uh, and so on basically what is kautilya's view uh, if the king is not strong and good then he cannot pick a wise minister therefore a king has has to be uh, the one who should come first therefore he says in 8.1.19 because he is at the head of the prakritis the above is called uttara paksha which is defined as the statement giving the final position uh, so we see the tantra yukti is a way of Uh, scientific elucidation or discussing any scientific matter any systematic discussion of any particular matter like this 32 tantra yuktis are given in the 15th chapter before ending the salient features we'll just deal with the other topics in arthashastra so that we get an idea war is discussed at length in four adhikaranas including activities of king about to march battle tactics and vyuhas tactics for a king uh, battling a more powerful king strategies to capture a fort these are definitely outdated today because they never had air force in those days uh, and uh, the kind of missiles and ballistic missiles intercontinental ballistic missiles we have nuclear bombs we have so uh, this is no longer that important but maybe in a low intensity war that like what we are seeing on a northwestern border this could still be relevant the adhikaranas on war including adhyaya on restoration of peace in a conquered country we have seen that great powers in the 21st century and the 20th century are conquering countries and then what is the state of iraq today i mean is afghanistan stable so these were considered in those times one adhikarana is devoted to sanghas small independent principalities especially of the warrior class uh, this is a reflection of the organization of various states and groups in those days the 14th adhikarana deals with uh, abhichara rights and uh, precautions against such rights abhichara rights are rights conducted not for the welfare of the yajamana but for the downfall of the opponent so if we to just recap uh, 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 summarize what we have seen in arthashastra we have two main parts one is public administration the second part is dealing with uh, foreign relations and military strategy in foreign relations the contribution of arthashastra is unique uh, to both uh, indian thought and also the world and it stays relevant today military strategy may no longer be relevant from a historical point of view the amount of detail we have available in arthashastra gives us an excellent picture of the state of the administration uh, at the time of chanakya which is about uh, 4th century bc uh, at least according to the current view such being the book how relevant is it today let us just consider that this is a manual meant for the ruling class is very clear it is not meant for everybody right uh, what is the ruling class today the ruling class today is uh, ias officers politicians and um, other officers of the state many of the ideas and frameworks uh, permeate the thinking of indians if uh, the ruling class wants to rule india using concepts known to indians this is a very relevant book the revenue system bureaucracy and the police system described in the shastra were followed by all hindu kings till about 400 years ago says kem panikkar my submission is that this is an invaluable text for civil service officers especially the indian foreign service officers and envoys for military officers politicians and also useful for historians let us end on one note Uh, Sun Tzu's *The Art of War*, another excellent book of a similar vintage, he studied not by not merely the Chinese military officers but others as well, even in the U.S. Uh, military academies. It's a prescribed text. Then why are we not prescribing Artha Shastra in our own uh, IAS training academies and uh, IFS training academies? 
think about it. It's a wonderful book, has a lot of material which is relevant to us and gives an excellent or a very rich view of some of the details not available elsewhere about ancient India. Uh, thank you.